I want to talk a little bit about uh, innovation and, uh, and what I've learned there and what we do at my company, ING. My name is Henk Kolk. I'm a chief engineer, as they call it, and I have a very simple mission. And my mission is to uh, put all of the future of ING in the hands of the engineers. So I want to liberate the engineers. I want to make them all powerful. I want to provide them with a safe environment to test whatever they like, and I want them to learn as fast as possible. And the name of this talk is Innovation at Platform Scale. The problem is, uh, months ago I had to come up with a name, so this was quickly uh, <laughs> the thing that I came up with. But the talk is really about what do you need to do to create a company that is awesome for engineers. And that's what I want to talk about. So if you, if you think this is not interesting, please go. And if you want to remain, ah, let's, let's talk about this. So, um, I do some more talks and I just want to warn you, whatever we did or thought we were, that we did the right thing is not a menu or a recipe for other companies. Eh? So, the only one that can decide whether something is a valuable idea for you in your situation is, is you, actually. Right? We want you to decide whatever you want to do, if you're working for us or in some other company, but it's your decision. So, let's talk a little bit about agility, because ING has been chasing agility now for uh, multiple years. And agility is a cool thing, right? Uh, we were in this, in, this, in this world where everybody had to come become agile, we had to do extreme programming, we had to do Scrum, we had to do Kanban. Um, and that's all great. Um, and at the end of the day, it's not about these fancy words. It's just about when something is very complex, you need to take little steps and then check whether it works. That's all. And, you, and even this rule doesn't always apply. Eh? When I drive to my work every day, it would be very uh, mean to the rest of the uh, users of the, the streets if I stopped every 50 minutes to check where I am and if that little uh, 50 meters forward was okay. So, so sometimes we use uh, a waterfall method, often we use uh, an agile way of working, but basically what we need all of you to do is think. We need you to think. We need you to think about what is the best thing that we can do right now. And, and, and therefore I want to give you just a little bit of this perspective. Today, it sounds like we're a bit in the a, in a fashion industry. We all have to do Docker containers, we all have to do microservices, right? Um, we all have to do uh, hypothesis-driven development. And, and the, the interesting thing is that hypothesis-driven development, or even the word hypothesis, is already 400 years old, right? It's scientific method. And, and when we talk about uh, little uh, uh, quality improvement loops that's already from the 1940s. So all of these ideas that are being recycled today in the software industry are quite old and solid, and, and you don't need all these fancy words, but you need to think. So, so that brings me to this, right? A lot of the conversation today in our organization is about this. Um, we don't want to just stupidly follow a list of requirements that has to be built. We want to discuss what is it that we really want to achieve. And this here is a quote that I stole from a guy called Jeff Susna. He, he wrote a fantastic book, uh, Designing Delivery, but just these simple words um, triggered a whole discussion in the bank, uh, including with security people like Pascal, who's here in the room. What is it really that we want to achieve and how can we do that better? And, and John here likes to explain this principle like this. He has this famous story about um, a question that NASA asked, I'm in front of my slides, eh? that NASA asked um, a couple of years ago. He said, hey, we want a pen that writes in space. And this pen that writes in space is a thing that is hard to achieve. Imagine the test environment, eh? it's a bit expensive. Um, and the problem is you have no gravity in space, so you need to do it a different way. But this was not an outcome, right? The outcome was they needed something to write in space. The Russian had a better solution. <laughs> they said, we just use a pencil. Um, and this is all about getting to the right questions. We see so many 
projects uh, still today where people are chasing a wrong type of goal just because the value dialogue has not been held, right? What is it that we want to achieve here? What is, what is, when is, are things good? So outcomes over impositions really brings us to continuously to what kind of problem is it that we're trying to solve. Now, and here's my whole point of today. If you remember one thing, engineers should be involved in this discussion. This is not something that somebody else decides. This is what a team together with a product owner uh, latches onto. What is the problem that we're trying to solve and how do we solve it best? And I've seen so many times that the problem either disappears or gets rephrased in a way that it's very simple to achieve. Yeah? And, and why do we all do this? Why do we all do this? So I want to talk a little bit about this deep conviction. You heard Johan Kerstens talk all, about it already a little bit. But we are convinced that software is eating the world. In my company, people are convinced that software is eating the world and that if we are not great in software engineering, we will just perish. The other thing is, if we become great in software engineering, we will win this game. And that's our mission. And we can only do that in one way, just making sure that all software engineers are empowered to learn as fast as possible. I'm quite happy that the IT Academy is sitting over here to help us with that. Um, so learning as fast as possible in as many directions as possible is what we try to achieve. So software is eating the world. Very important idea. It was a quote by Mark Andreessen. He was convinced that Silicon Valley type startups can basically wipe out any industry. Then speed is market share. Adrian Cockroft uh, demonstrated this principle at a company called Netflix. So Adrian was, the was one of the distinguished engineers at Sun Microsystems. But he took Netflix to the cloud. Basically, he was the first one to do it. And, and although things were look looking really bad for Netflix at that time, other uh, big companies were already latching onto streaming video. He just showed that by being faster and, and solving problems in a better way, that you can gain that market share that otherwise could elude you. Yeah? And we need more brain power on that. So the last one, platforms eat pipelines. I'll take a little bit because the talk is about uh, innovation at platform scale. I'll take a little bit more time about this. So platforms eat pipelines is about a new business model. The new business model that is winning from existing industries and that we all should understand better because in this new business model, there are design principles that we need to understand, all of us, if we are to help our companies uh, be better. So platforms eat pipelines is a phrase that my colleague Ron Kursik <laughs> uses a lot. And it's about this. A platform no longer just produces a product, but it ser serves an ecosystem of consumers and suppliers, uh, like Google does. People want to search, people want to, uh, businesses want to sell advertisements. If you search, uh, serve both, if you serve that as an ecosystem, you can grow very rapidly. Um, you would want to eliminate gatekeepers in that process to scale efficiently. So if you look at Airbnb, for example, it, um, it eliminates gatekeepers in the sense that there's nobody deciding whether you can rent a room or not. You don't have to search for uh, telephone numbers. You don't have to go to complicated booking sites. They just created a very simple platform in software that allows you to do this. And just like Uber, they run on a not even mine inventory, which is really cool because that allows them to scale fast. So <laughs> Uber doesn't own any cars yet. Um, but they don't any own any cars, they don't own drivers, right? They can just leverage something that al is already existing in a very rapid uh, way. So this is why platform business models are really important. And if we create platforms in big companies for engineers, we have to look at these principles and use them in the same way. So there should be no more gatekeepers for engineers to push software to production. There should no, be no more gatekeepers if you want to request a virtual machine. There should be no more gatekeepers if you want to play around with software. Yeah? Because you have to learn. No more gatekeepers. And, and this, is, this is my mission to give this to engineers at my company. 
a platform that allows them to do just this. And, and, and for this, I want to show you a little bit about how we changed in the last five years. So when we started, we had this waterfall approach to software engineering. You know, there were some people at the business side, there were some application developers, there were some, some developers responsible for running the systems, and the same thing at the infrastructure side. And then we started to do a little bit of agile scrum. Scrum was a big thing, right? We um, consistently followed, followed all the rituals of Scrum, not knowing yet that there was something better and deeper to be understood there, but that was okay. Um, and, and, then, and we did something right here already. We put some product owners on the business side. But when we continued, this created a lot of pressure on, on the ops guys, and we decided to create DevOps teams. So put the ops guys in the same team as the developers. We saw that, with, that Netflix had done it, um, and we thought this was all okay. It, I had a big argument with Jess Humble about this. Jess Humble is the guy who wrote the continuous delivery book, and he's, he told me, this is a stupid idea, this cannot be done. Yeah, but we had already done it. Um, so not knowing that this could not be done really helped us in just doing it. Um, and it worked for us, it worked for us. But we were still in a kind of water, agile, fall mode. Eh? Uh, some business decisions took uh, months while a developer could solve a problem in an hour. And, and these kind of things started hurting. So our business colleagues followed. They took out two complete layers of uh, hierarchy. They put the product owners and the designers in the teams. So by this time, we already had 400 different squads in the Netherlands. Uh, very low, very small level of uh, hierarchy left. And these guys are now running the business in, in the Netherlands. Tribes and squads. This model we copied from Spotify. We gave it our own twist. But it was more like the idea of, hey, how can we get these teams uh, to decide by themselves? How can we get them to understand the problems that they need to solve together? How can we, how can we wipe out all the handovers and all the gatekeepers in between and give them speed? How can we give them an environment where they can run, learn very rapidly? So these are the things that we were trying to solve here. And of course, this again created some pressure. And the pressure was on the infrastructure guys who also reorganized. And what you see here subsequently, really, is very invasive reorganizations of a bank. Time and time again, a big reorg. People needing to apply for different roles in a different hierarchy, etc. Right? We needed to do this, and we were not afraid to do this, because we wanted to have that kind of decision power in the teams. Now, we still have, we still have manual IT risk processes, right? And this year, this year, we're going to make the big push to even smooth that out for the developers. So, so when we're done, my friends here, John, and Pascal, and me, when we're done, uh, engineers can just define under version control uh, the VMs that they need, the firewall connections that they need, uh, the operating systems that they need. They can configure everything from, visor control, from version control and spin it up to production. This is the kind of power that we want to be in the teams. And we will make sure, we will make sure that they can do it safely and in a way that our supervisors are not getting really, really scared. Yeah? And the last thing is pr pretty fundamental for us, right? We're a bank. By law, we need to have a first, a second, and a third layer of defense when people talk about IT risk. But there's no law that tells us exactly how to do this. So this is something that we as engineers really had to get involved in. How do we design, how do we design safety? How do we design security? How do we design availability into our way of working, into our automation in such a way that it's really safe for engineers to play around and learn very quickly. If you want to learn what a little bit more or a little bit less memory does for your system, you just need to be able to spin it up and test the whole thing in a couple of minutes. There should be a principle of no fear. No fear for testers 
just to test the hell out of our systems. Break it. Break it. And because if you break it, it's not a bad thing. If you break it, you just can recreate it in a couple of minutes from version control again. Right? So this is the last bit. This is our last agile mile, if you want to call it like that, that we want to go through. So this has been a journey for engineers, for product owners, and for IT managers that has been changing their worlds quite significantly. And I hope you can see it, it's on the bottom, but engineers, five years ago, they were just um, responsible for coding, or responsible for manual testing, or responsible, yeah, you can stand up to make pictures, but, or responsible for, for designing, right? We split it up in disciplines, and then we created roles per discipline. And no more. We want engineers that are full stack engineers. And if you're working with us, we want you to mature and grow into this full stackness, meaning that you understand the operating system, you understand the networking, you understand the firewalls, you understand the JVM, you understand all the middleware, and, you have, and because you have been allowed to play with it as much as needed to build your systems. And here's the thing. You cannot teach experience, eh? and, and this is why we work together with IT Academy, for example, uh, because we need some kind of classroom training, but we need also to give this kind of freedom to engineers to experiment, 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 because each experiment is learning. The cost of validation of an hypothesis has to go to zero. Right? This is the kind of company, the kind of platform that we want to create because that is what will allow our engineers to come up with better ideas and test way more hypotheses than if they have to wait for months for a new server. Yeah? For the product owner, this also was pretty invasive, and, and this is where we had made, probably have made a mistake by not catching it early enough. So in the beginning, a product owner was like a program manager, and, but later on, uh, when we get, went to biz DevOps or even to DevOps, there bec the product owner got a full uh, responsibility also for IT operations. And we caught that a little bit late. It's actually now, after all these years, that we're formalizing this. So a product owner is responsible for IT risk items. And a product owner is responsible for availability. And a product owner is also responsible for technical debt. And these kinds of shifts are fundamental for the product owner and the team to mature together to this world where they are really empowered. Because you get to understand what you're doing. Now for the poor IT manager, right? The IT manager, five years ago, he was the boss. Just like Michael here, the boss, right? Responsible for all of the delivery, responsible for hiring and firing responsible for IT operations, responsible for everything, right? A very important person indeed. And of course, he still is, he still is. But his focus must shift now to the most important thing that our industry needs, right? He has to let go of all these fantasies of having the power and control. He must let go, that go and he must focus on one thing, make our people great. So this is how the role of the IT manager is shifting. And you can imagine that this is not easy to come by, right? This is not so easy to come by because you ask people to do a lot of change in a couple of years. There's a lot of change that we're asking people to go through and, and we want them to change even more because we think we are in a phase in this moment in time in the world that is as disruptive as the Industrial Revolution was uh, years ago. Things are shifting so fast that the only way to keep up for you, for me, for product owners, is to learn at maximum speed. And learning at maximum speed requires us to understand something different. We are human, right? This is not just rational thought. Right? This is not just zeros and ones in our brains. These are not just um, things we can explain to people, this is how we want you to do it, no. We have to ask you to change your basic assumptions. We have to ask Michael 
to let go of his bossness, in a sense. Yeah, horrible. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a lot of assumptions in people's mind, right? Um, the IT risk managers, they made assumptions about what good looks like. They created processes and process steps and forms that had to be filled in. And they did it with good intention. For them, this was what good looks like. But it's no engineering. It's no engineering. The engineers have to stand up and discuss with them better ways of achieving the same outcomes. And that's shocking to some people. Like, what? Um, so you are saying, Hank, you don't, you don't want to fill in all these forms. You just want to have a feedback loop on availability, and that's it. And, and yeah, that's what I want. Yes, that's what I want. Maybe it's not enough, but that's the first thing that I want. If it's not there, then it will not work. So challenging these basic assumptions in people is making change very hard. It's making changing a big organization very hard. And the cool thing I learned recently is if you get somebody to really change, you will see emotions. People will be upset or happy or enthusiastic. But here's the, here's the thing. In our brain, there's this piece uh, called the cerebral cortex, and it's about rationality, it's about language. And there's this piece which is a little bit older, which is a little bit older. We have it in common with the animals, with the mammals, and, and it holds uh, emotions. It does most of the automated tasks for us. But this is exactly what we want to change, right? If you want to change basic assumptions and basic behavior, it's this limbic system that has to change. And, and, you, can only, and you can see that you're hitting somebody's limbic system when you see some emotion. If I have, <laughs> have a conversation with people about where they need to go and how they need to change, and you don't see any emotion, you don't see any upsetness, Nothing is happening, really. So the cool thing is that, that we're in a transformation um, where we empower people in small teams to take full responsibility for the products that they deliver to our customers or the products that they deliver to our colleagues. Um, and we can only do it by accepting our humanness. We can only learn as fast as we want by accepting that humanness. And there's a fantastic book, and I just wanted to mention it. And by the way, it's also a beautiful picture. That's what I like, too. Um, but it's about being multi-level in our, our approach. If we want something to change or something to happen, we have to talk to this cerebral cortex through to our rationality. We have to be clear about what needs to be happen, what needs to happen in a rational way, right? We also have to talk to the elephant which is where all the power, all the energy of the human sit. And we have to motivate everybody uh, in a way that it, it's fantastic to go to this new situation. And last but not least, it's about changing the path. You can talk all you want, but if you don't give uh, engineers the space to really uh, iterate faster on infrastructure, or don't give them the tools that they need to, uh, to work better, then it really doesn't happen. Things will, change will be stalled. So this is why we said, and now we want people to really focus, some of our best brains to focus on a platform for innovation. Uh, we called it the engineering platform because it's mainly the engineers that we want to liberate. Um, but this is what we're creating now. And then there's this whole discussion about control, right? And for, for control, I, I would like to talk a little bit about control and speed. Because we need to go faster. And just like Max Verstappen, he's my hero, he drives a Formula One racing car, right? The only way to achieve control, to achieve high speeds, is to be in control. And by the way, you will never see Max Verstappen fill in some form in the corner when he tries to overtake somebody else, right? He doesn't have time for this. He doesn't have time for it. He has all the control in his hands, literally, when he's racing. And this is, in a way, the metaphor for, for empowering engineers uh, to do what they need to do. So I, I distracted myself a little bit with these two pictures because I loved the one to the left uh, so much. This is about a steering wheel, right? 
So in the 1990 steering wheel, people, uh, was already a big invention. Uh, the little cord that you see shows that you could take it out of the car. So this meant that you needed less room for the driver to get into the car, right? And it has a very lovely green button, and the button says radio, so for the first time you could talk to the, to the guys <laughs> that were helping you. And the, and the little red button I love even more because it said boost, right? It's what you press when you need your car to go faster. Lovely, huh? Now compare this to the tech that we give to drivers like Max Verstappen to really be in control, right? There are literally hundreds of controls and menus on his steering wheel that he can use to drive faster. And he can only drive faster if he's in control, literally. So this is what we're building for our people. This is how we try to support innovation at platform scale. So there's two things that we want to do here. So one is give people this kind of platform that allows them to fail fast and often and learn rapidly, both on infrastructure level and on the application level, right? And the other thing is we want to give them, we want to build for them a learning organization. So you can really learn super fast. And this means that, that we no longer do uh, just DevOps, right, or biz DevOps. It's biz dev security risk ops. It's, it's basically giving the people the control about everything. And that's a big thing for a bank. So we have a couple of principles driving this. So one is shift left, a principle that John Sherrod over here came up with. Um, and this is about making sure that everything we do as engineers is to the left of quality assurance. Yeah, if you just picture, you start to the left, your left, with some kinds of backlog, and you go all the way to right to systems in production, there is some quality assurance going on, right? Humans should be to the left of that quality assurance, everything. So there's no more patching in production. There's no more changing running systems by humans in production. All of that has to go through, um, through quality assurance. And we want to even push that further left to make sure that we're solving the right problems. So we're now pushing design thinking in our company. And design thinking meaning what is the problem that we really want to solve and spending more time on that. And, 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 and this is a big shift, even also for me. Some of our uh, design thinking ladies, uh, uh, Flavia, I had a session with a couple of months ago to design something around a specific problem, and she stopped me. Halfway the session, she said, Hank, you are feeling so hasty. And this was true, right? I only had a couple of hours to spend on, on one of our big problems, and I just wanted to get faster, faster, faster. And she said, no, please slow down. Please slow down and, and spend more of your time just being here with the people. So this balance between taking the time to, to really discuss the real problems and then speeding up, um, that is something that we have to learn still. So humans and robots, right? Um, there's a lot of talk this morning about robots. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the humans because the humans are still responsible for all the creation that goes that goes on, right? This is what we need you for. And this is what we want to empower you for. And everything to the right of uh, quality assurance, that's where the robots live. So, for example, very simple things. A CMDB should be filled 100% by a robot. No human should be able to touch it anymore because configuration drift is almost 100% guarantee if you let humans touch it. Um, yeah, immutable service. So, so we're now building the engines and, and releasing the engines to build your software only with immutable service. We built that with VM infra infrastructure, by the way, a little bit old-fashioned, but it has maturing, been maturing greatly. Um, 
What we want to achieve here is that humans really can no longer touch running systems in production. So we literally strip off <laughs> the, uh, the shell to log into a server. It's no longer there. You cannot go there anymore. If you want to change a running server in production, you have to start at version control and then go all the way. Cattle and pets. This is uh, a little bit of the story that's going on, but it, it extends the idea of immutability. So it was, here's the idea. Sometimes in the past years, when I was in the war room during a major incident, this was a scary thing because we were touching running systems in production, maturing them back, of, of, uh, of bringing them back to life even. And this is comparable to having a pet, right? If you have a pet, like a cat or a dog, it has a name, and you will spend a lot of money when it's sick to make it uh, healthy again. And this is a world that we want to live in no more. We want everything treated as cattle. So what's the difference? If you have a herd of cows and one is, re and one is sick, you just go <laughs> yeah, and you kill it off and put in a new one. And of course, this sounds a bit harsh when I'm talking about animals, but the whole idea is that this is just software. Eh? This is just software. Yeah? So, so we want to be able to gradually increase the DNA of our cattle as opposed to touching living animals and bringing them back to life. And that's a big shift in the bank. And that means that all infrastructure has to be code too. And this is a big shift for a lot of people, especially for some of our infrastructure colleagues who really struggle with this. Um, and you can see them shift, and, and they're getting it. But to retrain yourself and make sure that everything you do is under version control um, from an infrastructure perspective is a really big deal. So here's my little visualization of, of what we're trying to do here to allow engineers to change their company. Um, and basically, it means that we have a number of data centers, and we have this kind of control plane uh, with little robots, and little robots that guarantee that uh, we are in control, that guarantee that our engineers are in control, that everything that they do is auditable in a way that fulfills all the needs of our supervisors. And this is what we designed last year. Two of the guys who did that are sitting here. And, and, and this means that our delivery pipelines, so continuous delivery has already been a big part of our uh, journey, is really now starting to, to, to be supported more and more by these robots. They take over. They make sure that all the evidence is gathered during the work of the engineers. And they also make sure that engineers have a safe place to test every hypothesis that they want to do. So, to shift all of this in a very, very limited amount of time, um, we have just have to learn faster. This is the biggest challenge for organizations like us. Change faster. And, and there, was, there was a notion in the market that we would have to just hire different engineers. Well, guess what? They're not there. And, and of course, some of them are there, right? But if we would have to fire everybody in the bank and, and hire a bunch of new people, that would be such a silly business case because there's so much knowledge in the minds of the people already in the bank, right? And we want to rather invest in our people to make sure that they grow to that level of great skill. And this is why we're talking a lot about the learning organization, but actually doing it a lot. And, and this means also that weird assumptions from the past, right? That we had business architects and solution architects and requirement specifiers and designers and coders and testers and operators and deployers and I don't know what, that these were all different people. That IT has to be killed that idea has to go. We want you to be able to learn in all of these directions. Because you can. You can do so much more. 
right? This is just a false assumption in the industry, and we have to fight it. What we want is for you to be able to learn very quickly and in multiple directions at the same time. And this is the, yeah, the muddy way of that people learn, right? In the past, we like to give you a course or a training and then for you to follow it and then thinking, when you followed that training, we could sign you off and give you a certification, right? It's not how humans learn. It is not. We learn a lot at the same time by doing many things, by talking to great colleagues, um, and we can develop ourselves so fast in so many directions. This idea has to go, and this is why we um, build a new HR system. So we asked our HR colleagues also to change, and basically what we try to say here is that uh, people in a company who learn to be very competent or even experts, they should be paid very well for the impact that they have on a company. And this is how we want to coach people to whatever they want to do in life, in their profession, grow really fast and reward them for the learning that they did. So, all of that being said, a less inspiring picture, <laughs> because I tried to say too much here at the same time. Um, what you see is that in, in software companies like a bank, Agile product management is a skill that has to be supported by tools. And you have to do two things. You have to give the tools to the product owners, and you have to teach them how to grow into their role. Same goes for the creativity part, part right? Um, allowing designers and engineers to do their work on every level, if it's infrastructure, if it's security testing, if it's uh, just functional testing, if it's designing, and give them the tools to grow really fast, uh, test, automate all of the testing, and make sure that the robots can do the biggest part of the operations. So, in the words of the guy that talked about total quality management the most, right? Learning is not compulsory, <laughs> survival is neither. Eh? So thank you. This was my little talk for this afternoon. Thank you very much, Hank. So we have some room for questions. Some questions. No questions. Yeah, That's also good. Back. Oh. Thank you. So can you talk a little bit more about the shift left concept and exactly how do you apply that in, in, in the work? Oh, a little bit more, actually. No? Okay. I'll talk a little bit more about the shift left concept. So, in our industry today, um, we are changing running systems in production. And we are doing that uh, without proper testing. For example, when we have a problem with the network, we just go into routers, we go into firewalls, and we change them manually by hand. This is a big problem in, because all of this happens under high stress because something is wrong, and then we're not entirely sure whether we fed this back to our CMDB or to all the other firewalls or to the, all the other networking devices. This rarely happens. And, if, and, and this means, by definition, that over the years, uh, the configuration of everything you think you have running in production will just be not in control, entirely different everywhere. So shifting left more means um, making sure that every change you do to production systems, even to the infrastructure or to firewall ports, are done together with the application code. So basically what we do is, let me describe the process. So we have version control system, this is where we define the blueprints of the bank. So basically, the blueprints of the systems, the blueprints of the, uh, the stacks, the blueprints of how various components interact with each other, um, the software that is running on these components, both the binaries 
and the software that we need to compile in the next version, and we have all of that under version control. And this way, we can test a domain or an application or a complete domain from version control. We can regenerate it every time and test it as a whole, including all the infrastructure definitions. Right? This means that we can have total quality control over, <laughs> over, over our software. Of course, this is not enough of a guarantee, but it's much better than what many companies have today. Because today, you do not even know whether your acceptance test environment is exactly configured like your production environment. Because some human uh, was doing that configuration when he created the machines. So by making this process repetitive and fast, we basically shift left uh, everything that we do that humans create uh, to a definition from version control and make sure that we can basically build it up to production. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Cool. Anybody else? That sounded a bit too challenging. No, please no? give him the mic. Sorry. What is about, uh, so what's next after 2017 comes 2018 and so on? What do you see it changing? Um, so here's my ambition. In 2017, I want to give this tool set to all our engineers in all our countries. I want to onboard them on this engineering platform within ING. I cannot look any further ahead. Probably we will do a lot of tweaking and tuning in between. But this is the biggest step ever that I have done. Um, so in 2018, I have no ideas yet. I hope they fire me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. OK. No more questions? Okay. One more. We're thinking about what's next, and we're having something else every year. But I think that you can uh, agree with me, there are some teams and some projects where we are like 2014, 2012. Uh, do we think that maybe we want to stop and actually see what we have, reflect, and maybe then uh, think forward? So your question is really, aren't we changing too fast? Do we need some yes. more time for reflection? Yes. Yes. I can only agree, so that's why we come to conferences. <laughs> Have a few, no, no, no. Um, do we take enough time to reflect? I'm pretty sure that we don't. Yeah? So let, let that be the final remark at this talk. Yeah? We need to do this more. We need to make more time. We need to stop firefighting, and we need to start taking more time to think. Thank you.